you. It's great to be here today and speak about a topic which is really very timely. Um, in my current role, I'm having similar conversations with students and their families as they prepare to start college. So my intention for today is whether you're a parent, student, or educator, my hope is that this presentation will provide you with some information and resources to assist with the high school to college transition. So let's get started. I've included an image of this newlywed couple after a wedding, and I wanted to share this because I think it's a significant milestone event, very similar to what people are doing in preparation for the college process. So much planning leads into that big day or the sort of acceptance letter, admissions, testing, campus visits. But what do you do once you're admitted? How do you prepare for the aftermath, so to speak? In the college setting, we see an initial honeymoon period. For us, it usually lasts about three to four weeks. And then the shock or challenge of adjusting to the new environment may sit in for students. We know that challenges in executive function and emotional regulation make transitions even more difficult for students with ADHD. Research also shows students with ADHD often seek help only after things aren't going well. So this might mean it's closer to the midpoint of the semester before students realize that they need support. In my work, I've seen this to be true. So what I'd like to focus on today is how a combination of advanced preparation, open communication, and a strong support system can help to set your student up for success. That begins, I think, with strong preparation and scaffolding. So really, thinking about first, what self-advocacy skills does my student have? As caretakers, which responsibilities do you currently absorb? Once you're no longer there, who will take those responsibilities on going forward? What will your student do? who will need to make up the difference. This may include everything from waking in the morning, medication management, finances, doing laundry, appointment reminders, etc. I think it's important to start scaling back support while your child is still at home and give them the space to grow and learn in this safe environment. Consider where your student will need the most support and which resources on campus or in the surrounding community can offer that support. I also caution you to be mindful of allowing for what I consider a fresh start. Many students may feel stigmatized or isolated um, and may consider just completely getting off of medication or abruptly changing existing supports or scaffolding that may have been in place. It's typically recommended that we mimic supports from high school into college for at least the first semester or first year. I also recommend establishing local support in the area, whether that's at the institution itself or, as I mentioned, in the surrounding community. We'll talk about this a little bit later, but these things may include coaching, counseling, medication management, tutoring, working closely with a point of contact or trusted person, which often can be an academic advisor on campus. It's important to discuss these things, these topics with your student in advance. You may want to consider role-playing scenarios, helping your student to prepare for those difficult conversations with professors or staff members, perhaps establishing points of contact with different offices within the institution. Always using open-ended questions, it's better to coach your student instead of relaying information directly. To talk a little bit about the shift in responsibilities, I've um, created a couple charts. It's a lot of information, so I want you to have this for reference. I'm going to go through some of these slides rather quickly. But the big difference, I think, between high school and college, as I mentioned, many times parents and teachers are taking on the responsibilities to remind students of certain tasks. And college students must manage all of that on their own and set their own priorities. Students are usually directed and corrected if behavior will not lead to success, whereas in college, they must take full responsibility for decisions. Seeking academic support in high school may involve teachers who check regularly on students who appear to be struggling. In college, students are expected to ask for help from a professor if they feel like they're falling behind. 
And in high school, teachers may not be mindful of, or they are actually mindful of, of or perhaps can be, of not overloading, stu overloading students with the work. Whereas in college, it's really up to the student to figure out how to balance work, life, and social obligations. When we look at students who have ADHD, this can be extremely challenging. Um, the, again, as I mentioned, the executive functioning piece can get in the way, forgetting about appointments or assignments, feeling um, sort of anxious or avoiding certain tasks. Delayed gratification can be a challenge as well. In terms of daily structuring and scheduling, in high school, students have very designated hours where they're expected to be in class and in school, sort of this imposed structure that's created for them. College has an abundance of free time, and we'll talk about that a little later on in the presentation. They have freedom to select courses, which is great. Um, it can also be overwhelming for the ADHD student who really doesn't know what they're meant to be doing or what the future may hold for them. So overwhelmed with endless possibilities, they may think, um, strategically, in terms of the class selection, um, they mean it's assistance in thinking strategically and turning passions into career options. They may not be sure how to maximize time between classes, which can further be complicated with the medication management piece. It may be difficult to find areas of interest or judge length of assignments. In terms of identifying supports, Another difference would be sort of the legal changes that happen around accommodations. In high school, students um, are really sort of set up by the school system through IEP or 504 process for classroom accommodations, testing environments, and other required settings. College, that changes where the student must self-advocate. Students have to self-identify to the Office of Disability Services or Office of Accessibility to advocate for their needs with regard to accommodations. In high school, students are not expected to keep up, keep up with graduation requirements. And in college, it's really, again, the onus is on the student to clarify, ask questions, and take ownership of their own academic planning. An example of this might be difficulty with the forethought, might prohibit arranging testing accommodations for an upcoming exam. Overwhelm or anxiety can cause avoidance or procrastination. And with regard to learning environments and instruction, high school usually is a much smaller setting. I mean, many students that I work with come from smaller schools where the student-to-teacher student ratio is, is, is pretty significantly smaller. In the college setting, it's not uncommon for students to be in large lecture classes of 100 or more students. Um, professors may not be aware that students are not engaged. The students need to be thinking about how to really help uh, prepare them and work to create an environment where they're going to be engaged in that process. In high school, teachers have been trained in teaching theories and helping students learn the material. In college, professors are really experts in their field and researchers who are there to share knowledge with students. Students must draw connections on their own. The biggest difference, I think, and to sum it up, I'd like to sort of quote one of my um, coaches. I have a staff member who shares with her students that really high school is a teaching environment while college is a learning environment. Again, the onus is on the student to navigate and advocate. So let's take a look at how you can begin to help your student do so. I find with colleges, it's less about the size of the institution and more about how each office or department works to support students in a collaborative manner. You may want to find out how the school works to break down silos to communicate and collaborate effectively. And I understand the next big step can be overwhelming, and each university has their own supports and processes for assisting students with ADHD and learning differences. Again, a proactive approach is important. The resources are there, and it's about empowering your student to take ownership of the process. Here are some sample questions you could ask the institution to assess resources and receptivity. You may want to consider what supports are available on campus to help my child start college successfully. What you want to listen for are early identification programming, or programs that target common student difficulties. If a child begins to struggle with academic concerns, what programs do you have on campus, campus to support them in regaining academic satisfactory status? 
This might involve mid-semester programming or looking at points of contact in various offices. Some institutions use early alert systems or concern reporting to help triage concerns. So let's take a moment to evaluate how you can help your student create a strong support network. When I'm meeting with incoming freshmen, I like to ask some basic questions to help assess what it looked like for them in high school. So really thinking about what did it take for you to be successful previously? What type of academic support did you use? Perhaps a learning specialist? Did you work with an ADHD coach or tutors? Did you rely on teachers or your parents to assist? How did you balance your time or schedule? Again, I think I recommend scheduling these options and coordinating service prior to the start of classes. Let's talk through each area and what options may be available to your student at your institution. So starting with academic support. The academic advising piece is so important because in most institutions, this is going to be the main point of contact that your student will have. Some institutions use as faculty advisors as well. And academic advisors assist students with all sorts of academic planning um, options, from major selection to strategic registration, looking at exploratory advising options and assessment tools as well. So for students with ADHD, we know that they have a lot of creativity, multiple talents and interests. And one of the things that we use here in our um, campus we have advisors that work across different majors and curricula. We also have advisors that work really specifically with ADHD students who are in the exploratory phase. They're not really sure what they want to do. Um, and so it's sort of getting a sense for what are their interests, what are their values, what are the things that they are strong in academically, and where are the areas where they need to improve. We also have sort of a core curriculum flexibility. So thinking about at that institution, what would it look like if my student were interested in business or engineering? What are the programs that are a little bit more prescriptive, and what are the ones that allow for um, more flexibility across different majors? All of these things are important to think about, because what we know about ADHD are we students who are going to be highly motivated are also really strong. Well, I should say interest and motivation are very closely connected. I mean, if they feel good about what they're studying and they're interested in it, then they're going to be more inclined to perform well and, and, and sort of meet those academic goals. With regard to other academic areas, um, you know, the Office of Accessibility or Office of Disability can assist, as I mentioned, with accommodations. They may also have a learning specialist or consultant on staff. They may offer strategic learning workshops or help students to coordinate assistive technology that they may need in and outside of the classroom. Faculty are a great resource. I can't um, recommend this enough. Students who meet with faculty early on and establish that relationship are really in a, at a better position, um, especially if they're going to be meeting with them to discuss accommodations. It gives them the perfect opportunity to go to office hours and make those initial connections. There may be a faculty mentoring program. If your student is really um, interested in working closely with a professor for research or looking at different internship options, that initial relationship or building that initial contact can be really important in the beginning. There's also various, uh, whether you call them success or learning centers or resource centers, different institutions have those. And that's basically academic support. So thinking about content-specific tutoring, um, looking at are those group sessions, are they one-on-one -on -one individualized sessions? Does the institution have assistance with writing support? So you know, long, large projects can be difficult for students with ADHD. So thinking about um, what are the different points in time or what are the courses that may be necessary for them to receive assistance with writing? Um, many universities offer a program called Supplemental Instruction. This is a great program. Basically, this is, involves a student who has done really well in the course. They're invited back in by a faculty member to hold review sessions several times throughout the week. Um, and the idea is that they're really sort of flipping the classroom and letting the students lead the discussion. So it's minimal instruction, but it's really student-focused, student-led learning. 
Uh, as we found here, and I think other institutions can say the same, students who participate in SI receive a higher grade in that course relative to their non-SI peers. And there's also, there could be peer mentoring or coaching, which can assist students in just the general transition with regard to um, establishing social circles, getting involved on campus, just general roommate ch or relationship challenges. There's so many things that a peer mentor or coach can assist students with. Some universities have uh, ADHD-specific mentors. There are even some organizations, such as Eye to Eye, different campuses, that work to um, provide community support as well. And finally, what I really enjoy talking about would be uh, the coaching piece. I'm an ADHD coach. I've worked for the last um, eight years specifically with college students. Um, and so thinking about coaching, it's a wonderful resource for your student uh, because really what ADHD coaching does, we educate and lend support towards self-management. And we look at strategies that will minimize ADHD challenges and optimize strengths. Um, and that all coaching programs, are, very, you know, there's an array of different programs on campuses. Some focus really specifically on academics um, or the tactical side of coaching, which is great in that there are strategies and there's a planning. But what we know about ADHD, it's not necessarily about getting things done. It's why aren't they getting done? What's getting in the way? And oftentimes, that's sort of the emotional regulation piece. So with our particular program and the models that we use, we really focus on the who. We focus on the what and how as well, but the who is really important. So looking at old habits, belief systems, thought patterns, what could get in the way? Um, and when we're thinking about that, it's important because, as I mentioned, we know emotion and motivation are so closely connected. Students have to feel good about what they're doing to initiate and have that follow through. I'm moving on to personal support. So I think it's important to talk about self-care. Um, I often work with students on building a strong foundation because we know that symptoms are exacerbated when self-care isn't honored. And the things that I think are non-negotiable are really sleep hygiene, physical activity, nutrition, and stress management. I've seen this in my work with students, and I've seen it in my own family. Thinking about mind-body connection is important. When self-care isn't prioritized, it can really feel like the wheels are coming off and it's difficult to get it together. In coaching, we also work with students who may involve, be involved in, um, in counseling as well. If there are other challenges that are coming up related to the transition around overwhelm, there could be some shame, anxiety, fear, or depression. Students may get stuck, um, and this may be related to a number of things, as well as family or origin concerns, substance issues. Um, so those two services or these two models really work well together. Um, one thing that I, I usually see students who benefit really well from is cognitive behavioral therapy and counseling and coaching, so that's a good pairing. The other things that would be important to consider, if your student has been working with a clinician and you know that that's something that you want to continue, I think it is a great idea to have that local support established. I've seen students who um, may choose to Skype with certain uh, therapists or coaches, and I think that that's fine. If, you know, I get that there's a relationship there they want to continue, but I think there's a strong benefit of having someone local. You would want to talk with your institution about what that uh, service looks like. How often would my student be able to meet with the counseling department? Are there a, 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 is there sort of a limit to the number of sessions that they get? Um, and that's where you would want to take a look at community providers. Most institutions could help you with, or assist you with that process, be able to provide referrals that are close to campus or in the surrounding community. Um, Again, thinking about what are the other things that could possibly come up. In the event that there, there is a crisis situation or your student needs more um, intensive support, you, you usually want to contact the case management or junior student's office for health and safety referrals, or if they're just having challenges navigating the campus and community environment. It's also a great place for self, student self-advocacy. Um, thinking about mindfulness, as I mentioned, we know that that is such a a really prominent new method to help students with stress management. So some universities have mindfulness programming or collaboratives. 
looking at fitness classes, yoga, health education. Um, there's even different opportunities uh, such as group work, group sessions. Um, so these are all things that you may want to consider. And then finally, in terms of community support, this really would include the living environment and any social circles your student would be a part of. Um, in terms of the, con the, the living environment, thinking about what might work, you know, I've talked to students before about, you know, sort of that personal space and creating a safe personal space. We know that sometimes students have a difficult time winding down at night. Sleep becomes a challenge. So if they're used to sleeping by themselves in a room, what would it look like to share a, a residence hall, dorm room with someone? How can they recreate those routines for waking and sleeping? Um, what about organizational habits? You know, might think about what would be necessary or needed in that room, something like a dry erase calendar, something that we use in coaching a lot, this concept of a launch pad, which is essentially a basket that can house all the important items, the keys, phone, wallet, that sort of thing. Really creating that space so that, you know, that student feels comfortable and organized from the beginning. Coaching can also assist, as I mentioned, with all of those processes. Um, thinking about food, meal options, so dietary needs are important. Um, you know, some students may have food allergies, whether it's, you know, gluten-free or what have you, thinking about how to get quick meals and healthy snacks, something that they'll be able to keep on them if they're running out the door and don't have time for breakfast, something high protein, low sugar. Um, you know, we know that there are millions of neurons in the gut which influence neurotransmitters in the brain. We know that what you eat impacts how you feel and think. Sometimes students may not want to eat throughout the day because medication may prohibit that, but I, I always encourage our students to keep a snack with them. They can eat in between classes. Thinking about those things are important. Uh, discussing finances or budgeting. Uh, if that's something that your student is going to be responsible for, thinking about what that would look like um, month to month. Again, very open with communication and establish, establishing those sort of expectations from the beginning. Um, Student organizations and involvement. So there's usually so many different ways that a student can get involved on campus, whether it's through uh, intramurals or co-curricular activities, student organizations, service opportunities. It's almost, there's almost sort of this um, overwhelming abundance of things to do. And so that's, I think, thinking about what are the, the areas of interest that are very strong, what are the values that your student has, and how can they round out the academic experience with these other things. Uh, in looking at time, one of the things that I like to talk about with, with my students, are, you know, say for example you have a 15-hour course load. You know, and some students may be taking 18, some may be taking 12, but looking at like say 15. If you think about time in and out of class, really that's about 30 hours a week. So you consider it would be like three hours per credit hour. Um, and breaking that down over the course of a week, you know, you think about, you know, that's, that's about 82 hours of down, downtime. If you think 16 hours in a day are free with eight hours, say eight, eight hours of sleep. Um, so, you know, with 82 hours of downtime, how will you best use that time between academics, social, et cetera? So that, there again is, there's sort of this abundance of time that they may not have had in high school. So thinking about how to really maximize those personal and academic um, opportunities. Uh, it's important to choose wisely. I think in the beginning, especially in the first semester, first year, um, you don't want to sort of get overcommitted or overinvolved. Uh, but it's, you know, having those kinds of conversations to think about what makes sense is, is really key. And then finally, some sample questions. Uh, I think it's important to just prepare for ups and downs. You know, stu students are going to hit roadblocks. It's inevitable. Um, how your student chooses to respond is key. I think if you're familiar with any of the work by Carol Dweck on growth mindset or Dr. Marley Adams, the learner versus judger model, this is very similar. You know, at such crossroads, we know the benefits of a mindful pause in this moment. We know that pausing to pay attention to what you're paying attention to, you know, whether it's positive or negative, makes a difference. And as coaches, we work with students to pause and choose an intentional response instead of reacting from emotional dysregulation. 
We know that rumination and negative mindset can set in due to an overactive amygdala in the brain. However, there are strategies to help. Um, it's important to remember that their sense of urgency isn't necessarily your sense of urgency. So questions can help create thoughtful, mindful dialogue about choices and next steps. This can help guide you to guide your student in the most appropriate resource. Why questions? Well, I think neuroscience tells us that there, when people are able to connect and remember and activate on something on their own, when they derive that information, it's really more powerful than that information being given to them by someone else. So this idea of active versus passive learning. And here's some sample questions that you can use with your student throughout the course of the first semester. I'm thinking about, you know, how's your living situation? What about your roommate? How are your instructors? What areas of interest that you have? Are you using office hours? What supports are you utilizing? Um, what's your level of motivation? You know, scale from one to five and thinking about what that would look like. What would if it's a two, what would make it a five? What do you need to do to get there? Um, what are the important academic deadlines? This is really this is really important. So knowing, you know, what is the last day to add? What's the last day to drop? What about re registration? Thinking about how your student will get involved on campus. So these are just, again, ways to get the dialogue going, get the lines of communication open with your st student. Uh, so finally, I'm, this is the last slide, and I just wanted to sort of talk about takeaways. Um, you know, what are you leaving with today? And thinking about how can you best support your student through the transition. The key pieces I really think are, um, you know, setting goals and expectations of and for college, thinking about academic and personal pursuits as well as those strong support systems or networks, how often you should communicate with, with your student, how often you should communicate with the college and what that could look like, and then finally environmental changes. Um, Again, thinking about what's necessary in the residence hall with regard to organizational habits, food, sleep hygiene, medication management, et cetera. So that's what my presentation. I thank you for your time.